When you're collectively making a feature, I, I wish in my head I could go back to that space. There's so much joy associated with this, so much excitement. Picture ban rahi hai. You know what I'm saying? It was just unreal, you know, standing at the back of the hall and watching the audiences laugh. I don't think I'll ever be able to duplicate. Nothing will even ever come close to that. Nagesh, Hyderabad blues is really the sort of proverbial fairy tale, which makes you believe in the magic of show business. Yep. I mean, first time director, unknown director, unknown star cast, minuscule budget, 17 day shoot. Yep. And you create a movie that becomes a landmark, that becomes a sleeper hit, and that becomes a sort of jump start uh, for the indie movement here. Yep. Uh, what do you think really enabled this to happen? I think uh, for the most part, uh, uh, stupidity <laughs> and, and not knowing enough. I, uh, I always tell people this that, uh, you know, sometimes having a lot of information about something prevents you from taking these stupid leaps of faith. Sure. Uh, because you'll get too scared before we, you start. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, had I known even a little bit about the show business that existed in India back in 1997, there is no way in hell I would have made something like Hyderabad Blues. I'd been living in the US for a little while. Uh, I had this pipe dream that uh, there was a filmmaker in me, which nine out of 10 people I meet on the street have it. And uh, I'm often told that, oh, you know, my dream is the same as yours. Just foolishly, I think that, okay, all I have to do is, you know, quit my job, take my savings and come here and things will happen. But it's that stupidity, it's that naive, you know, belief that good things will happen if you set your mind to it. And I found that in all the years, this is the only way that you can get films made. Mm. I just show up here, I know no one, I have money which I brought in the US uh, as con from the US as contraband. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, just my savings in cash. Uh, Are you serious? So like a drug dealer, you were literally carrying? I was carrying cash. I was carrying cash and some gold coins. No. Yeah. yeah. And I how mean, much was this? What was the budget of this film? Um, all the way through till marketing, uh, it was $40,000. Which w at that time at would that have been? At that time was about 12 lakhs, I think. Wow. Yeah. If you add in the marketing part, I think it totaled up to 16 or 17 lakhs. But the feature was done in about 12 lakhs. I was an engineer. Um, I can say was comfortably now. For the longest time, I would say I am an engineer. But um, so uh, putting things in boxes, organizing things was my forte. And you would never have thought that that part of the brain would come to the rescue uh, when planning a feature. Because everything was in little boxes. I knew how much money I had. I knew what I had to do to bring it in that. and just went and did it, never actually thought about any of the consequences, ye kya hoga, distribution, ka, nothing. You just made it? Just made it. You know, as filmmakers, you try and uh, get creative and come up with creative sayings that you think will, you know, make you sound intelligent. Uh, so I would always say, uh, you know, you do all your hard work and just get ready and stand in the path of luck and allow it to carry you. So that's exactly what happened. Nagesh, you were leading man writer, <laughs> producer, <laughs> director. So how in the world did you sort of keep these hats straight? When did you know which one to wear? Honestly, a lot of this training happened uh, in Atlanta. Um, I always said that I wanted to do something with films. I didn't know exactly what. And you know, different people tell you at different times, are tu actor ban ja, tu ye kar, wo kar. You know, I, I really didn't know. Um, so blindly, I took a workshop on uh, uh, film production. Um, this was up in Maine. It kind of opened my eyes a little bit. I was like, okay, I think I want to do this. But it wasn't until I started studying at this place called the Warehouse Actors Theatre in Atlanta that, and I learned acting. The irony is I studied acting for three years and I haven't technically studied direction per se. So, but as I acted, I began to realize that I could actually extricate myself from the physical process of being an actor and look at it uh, you know, very dispassionately as a 
director, if you will. At that time, I still didn't know if I could. But and say what was wrong with the scene, what was what could be done to make it better. And it was at this place that I would constantly ask my fellow actors, I would say, is it OK if I offer a suggestion? I'd say, see, roughly when you did blah, 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 you need to do this because that's what we planned, you know, stuff like that. And that's where I started developing this thing of, you know what, I actually want to direct. And when I came to Hyderabad, uh, you have to remember circa 1997, there was no organized pool of actors. There were no casting directors. There was no one. And I was looking to make a feature, which mo most of the people thought it was a hoax, because there was English, Hindi, and Telugu. So who fills that slot? And I needed to get the American accent right. I actually started casting. It wasn't some you know, narcissist. Uh, you didn't think it would be you? No, I never, I never came at it from that. But it became very apparent in the first week that I was there that it would have to be me, because you know no one had that bastardized Indian American accent. No one could speak Telugu and the Dakini which we speak in Hyderabad. And everyone had grown up on really bad 90s Bollywood. <laughs> so once I start auditioning these guys, they're freaking hamming and you know, I was <laughs> like, ah. <laughs> so yeah, so it quickly became apparent that I had to wear that hat. But honestly, I was confident because when, uh, when I'd studied at what, I became uh, comfortable enough in doing a scene, then stepping back and saying, you know, da, 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 this needs to be done. And I felt, and if you see Hyderabad Blues, it's virtually all masters. It's how you would shoot, loosely put a play. Occasionally the camera pans. A uh, lot of handheld too. A lot of handheld because, you know, in places that you couldn't actually move the camera and you had to cover stuff, you did that. It was shot in my head not very cinematically, but more like what I had developed at what. So I knew how to block scenes, and then the camera would record the blocked scene. I, if you look at the edit, the editor was done in, I think, a couple of days, because he just had to <laughs> splice the. It was all done. Yeah. So coming back to your question, the writing was done. Um, I'd written it on a previous trip, trip to India. I took it back, tested it with my act fellow actors. We did a reading. Um, that was done, blocked. The actor, director, I knew I could manage. And the producer, there was no choice. I mean, I, I had the money. So, um, and I knew what was going on. Uh, as you know, my mom, dad, my aunt, cousin, not to mention another eight aunts and uncles and all, everyone chipped in with their homes and everything else. But these four or five people were at the core of everything that happened. And obviously, they knew nothing. <laughs> So it was me telling them that, okay, you know, for this, so I would give them printouts of, you know, scenes with costumes and, uh, but it was a truly a mom and pop shop, uh, uh, you know, experience, but. But yeah. I have to, I have to, Nagesh, admire your parents. I mean, here's the chemical engineer's son with this job, you know, in, in America, sort of the Indian dream. Yep. Yeah. And then he says, no, but I want to come back and make movies. And they're actually helping you to do that. I've, I've told this story often enough. Uh, in 93, almost three or four years before the whole dream came true, uh, my parents visited the US. And I remember we were all sitting on the floor and eating biryani and uh, that my mom had cooked uh, in my apartment in Atlanta. And I said, I want to do something else. So the you know seeds were sort of cast back then. And... Uh, so my dad said, great, so when are you getting your MBA? I swear, that was his uh, comeback. And yeah, he but said- But of course, it, yeah. it would have to be an MBA. That's the <laughs> next step. And uh, I said, no, um, I want to do something with movies. This is what I said. And there was silence. And uh, my parents truly are the most chill out. My dad's one of the greatest guys in terms of the way he thinks. So he was like, ah, OK, it's a passing fancy, uh, whatever. And nothing was said for the next three years, right? So everyone's thinking it's done and dusted and uh, he's forgotten about it. And uh, I don't think till I physically showed up after quitting my job, not once but twice. I quit it first in 95, came to India, tried to get into Bollywood, realized that it was not for me, and then came back a second time to make Hyderabad Blues a year later. Then they realized, oh, this, this guy is serious. And then, that's what makes them great parents. Then they're like, 
okay, let's let's all help and make this thing happen. That's amazing. Yeah. That's so, amazing. Yeah, so can't thank them enough for it. Did you storyboard? I did. I did. Uh, the same uh, th the same stupid stick figures that I started back then is something that I still do even really? now. Back in the day, obviously, it was my first feature. So I actually followed my storyboard. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, ah, oh, camera ya pe roko, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah, I did. So you're, of course, acting. And so is your assistant director, Elahi. <laughs> 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 okay. So who was keeping track of the shots? So uh, yeah, quick word about Eli. So she she comes on board five days before the shoot because she's cast as the second lead or the second oh, so lead's she was wife. Cast as an actor before mm -hmm. anything else. Way before anything else. So what happens is I come to Hyderabad to make the film. I ask around and they say, "Oh, there's a person who could connect you with a lot of other people. She's truly connected to Hyderabad. Her name's Elahe." I try reaching out to a can. Uh, she's busy with other stuff. I come back and now she's available. So, okay, I meet her and while talking to her, I said, oh my God, this is Seema. So, I asked her, would you audition? Yeah, yeah, of course. So, I auditioned her. She was perfect. So, I cast her and February 17th is when we started shooting, uh, 1997. And February 12th, we do the first reading at my place. And everyone's gathered around and it's awful because most of them are not actors. There's like chaos in the room. People are reading stuff and you know, I'm trying to make sense of it. So anyways, when you're collectively making a feature, I, I wish I could, uh, in my head, I could go back to that space. There's so much joy associated with this, so much excitement. Picture ban rahi hai. You know what I'm saying? So everyone's sitting around the room and I stepped out to go grab something. When I came back in, there was a huddle going on and I hear Elahe helping the other actors. You know, maybe you want to say the line like this is. So I kind of watched it from a distance. We finished the reading and I said, do you want to be my assistant director? She's like, yeah, but not knowing what it entails. Yeah, absolutely clueless. You know, she was, uh, she had a designer store, right? A lawyer who had a designer store decides to act in the film and then is my AD. And what the hell was I thinking, setting out to make a feature without even a single AD? Not the one. You didn't have anyone in no. mind. I, I didn't have anyone. Madam, you thought I would do it I don't even know what I was thinking. I knew that I needed someone for script continuity. So there was one girl who I had met called Rucha, who also made her first feature, I think, last year. And she, I said, Acha, you have to write stuff, whatever you see in the shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's all who I had. There's no one and I was going to, I was going to make this feature. So then I had an AD, I had a legit AD who <laughs> comes on board. And then of course that association started there because she ended up being much more than an AD on the shoot. But how did you keep track of shots? First of all, I decided that my shooting ratio, all lovely fancy words, but very important when you're shooting film. Mm, yes. I'm sure you can attest to this because right. Every time you could hear the camera just roll, you're like, oh, uh, that's that's thousand bucks, uh, that's two thousand bucks. I mean, it was. <laughs> so the producers also thinking. <laughs> exactly, a can was what back in the day, ten, yeah. twelve thousand bucks, right? So I had budgeted for a shooting ratio, which I thought like was one is to three. And then the math didn't quite work out, so I ended up somewhere in the neighborhood of one is to one point eight or one is to two or something like that. So basically, I had two tries to get the master right. That was it. So there really wasn't much about keeping things straight in. Uh, I mean, uh, as the script sure. continuity part. Because you could only do it twice. Pretty much. I mean, I if I went three on one, then I'd try and compensate somewhere sure. else. But one thing that, again, I have been pretty good about, this is the one thing that's helped me all throughout, is I'm able to keep track, not that arrogance of don't worry, sir, it's all in my head, like, you know, mm. it's mm. all here or whatever. Not that. But I've always been able to, oh, okay, this joins here, so this joins. So there wasn't any panic on my part ever. Right. Because you know where, how it's fitting in. That, for some reason, my brain was able to get it right from day one. Okay, this is going to fit here, that's going to, oh, I need that. Yeah, it was always that. So. Yeah, we had notes and we had script continuity notes, but it wasn't that much of a concern. You said that there were days when you moved the camera angles like 50 times. That was, yeah. 
That was the... How did you do it? <laughs> uh, uh, there's a scene in Bollywood calling where the actor shows up to the set and there's no one and finally the uh, a cameraman shows up. And this guy asks him, why are you on time? And he says, I'm starting beginning cameraman, no? When I'm famous, I can also be late as... This happened to me. I went on a Telugu uh, TV set and I met this cameraman. He and I were the only two people. So he foolishly said, someday if you shoot your feature, I'll shoot it for you free. Really? Yeah. His name's Ram Prasad, who's a very well-established Telugu uh, film cameraman now. So I called Prasad on it and I said, uh, will, you, will you shoot this film? So he said, yeah. And he being from the industry gave a whole requirement of lights and everything. And I said, listen, I have this much money, so whatever lights you can get in this, that's plenty. Yeah, that's one. And there was no such thing as, okay, today we are planning for eight shots. There wasn't anything like that. I just come on set, I knew I had to cover this much and we did whatever was necessary. So the budgeting for the climax was done for those two days. I had rented a marriage hall. Right. And every single relative was requested to come on that one pivotal day. So we filled the, the, the mandap and if you look at it, it's all low angles because only the front row has about 10 people sitting and then the seats are all empty from the back. <laughs> and we just went at it. So there was no, I'm, I'm sure he just died because there was no concept of, okay, set up light. It was just put the camera here. Okay, we got the shot. Okay, the, put the camera here. And we just went hammer and tongs. And that is both my plus and minus because I get so blindsided by the fact that I need to get this much work done in a day that I think a lot of times I don't allow myself the luxury of saying, maybe I can go an extra day or half an extra day and get this r better. Uh, right from that, st not stupid, right from that first film is this madness. and. That, if you see the climax, it's, um, I, I'd l I, I was trying to be clever when I said it was Shakespearean farce-like, but it was just chaos. <laughs> yes. You know, uh, there are things that you do intuitively, and I always say this for anyone who wants to be a filmmaker. 90% uh, of the job is having good organizational and communication skills. 10% might be creative. And if you have room for anything else, it's intuition. Trust the gut. Just trust the gut. There's no right or wrong. So even something like crossing the line, I was just doing, you know, instinctively. It's like camera here, so it went here. It was not like actively drawing lines and sure. you know, thinking about it. Tell me where some of those <laughs> amazing lines came from, like dil pe mat. Dil pe mat le, yaar. Haat me le. <laughs> that became a sort of anthem for a while, <laughs> you know? You know, it almost didn't make the final cut. Why? So, um, I remember, um, was this last year or the year before last when um, Urta Punjab uh, I think created this big sure. furor, right? Yeah. Oh, sense about this, that. And I was kind of laughing because I said, get in line because Hyderabad Blues got 91 cuts. Unbelievable. So, they wanted every small gali every reference to this i don't even remember but obviously the original letters lying somewhere so uh, we did the evaluation we did the um, what's the second one the uh, review committee right then finally we went to the uh, tribunal and you remember justice lent yeah yeah okay so uh, as you know tribunal is like a mini court right yeah. so we're sitting on stage and mrs kuti was uh, representing the censor board and i was on the other side and uh, she said, oh, and this line, dil pe mat le, she took a pause and uh, she said, it's a reference to uh, masturbation. So then uh, once the quote unquote accusations made, then the filmmaker has to defend it. And I said, yes. And oh. Justice Linton laughed and said, let it go. There was a, I mean, there's nothing. It's amazing. It's. It's obvious that yeah. that's exactly what it's it referring is. to. Yeah, yeah. So that came out of a, a, a drunk session with my buddies. I think it was in the second or third year in college. I don't remember. And obviously, uh, someone founded it clever enough to say that Dilpe Matle is a common Hyderabadi hmm. phrase. Hmm. The Hatme Le was the the add-on that. <laughs> the innovation. The innovation, <laughs> and and uh, then 
our group used it a lot. So it's something that made an, uh, you know, made its way into the script. So. But Nagesh, at that time, in 1997, you're making a film which has kissing. Right. Right? Big thing. Oh my God, big thing. And yeah. cursing. They are all cursing. Yeah. Right? And, you know, your character is commenting on the chauvinism of his best friend. What's your problem? It's not a grocery store. You just can't pick him up off shelves, okay? Don't start your foreign bullshit with me, yaar. This has been happening for generations. Doesn't make it right. At least I'm not asking for dowry. Big fucking favor you're doing her. Shit. Again, did this come because you just didn't know that you would face problems? Or or uh, did you think about, okay, sensor board may problem hoga, but I'll get through it? No. The truth of the matter is, I never expected Hyderabad Blues to work in India. I didn't write it for a Western audience. I wrote it without having any restrictions in my head. Sure, you weren't censoring yourself. I mean, since I've started dealing with the censor board, it's a constant battle every time I put words on paper, wondering, oh, will this get passed, you know, stuff like that. But back then, I never thought it would work in India. So as far as I was concerned, I was going to make this feature, which I did on June 18th, I believe, 1997. I got my six cans. I put it in my suitcase and I left for the States. And as far as I was concerned, I said goodbye to India. And I started applying to the film festivals. The short version of the story is uh, just before I left, uh, on Eli's insistence, we had a small screening at Eros Mini and uh, Shambhabu was invited. And Sham Benegal. Sham Benegal. And he was the chairman of the first Mami festival. And someone, uh, Uma Dukuna suggested this uh, section that they wanted to include called View from Abroad, where they wanted to invite Indian filmmakers living outside of India, making films on India. And uh, she said, I heard about this film called uh, Hyderabad Blues. And Sham Benegal said, oh, I've seen the film. It's delightful, his, his words. Uh, yeah, put it in there. And so I came here for Mami and the rest. You know, I was at that first screening. It was somewhere I in see. South Bombay, right? Yeah. At Mami. Yeah. They, they, they Chavan and NCPA. Absolutely. And I remember watching that movie and thinking that, wow, this is really new. This is really oh, different. Wow. And I remember the, the sort of how quickly the buzz caught on. And, and it just became this, you know, this must watch movie. Um, and of course, it launched you, Nagesh, on yeah. to a flourishing career as a filmmaker. But did you at that point even have a plan B, like if it hadn't worked? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll once again refer to my dad uh, to answer that question. Uh, Hyderabad Blues, I wrap, I, I put, put the cans in my suitcase and I'm leaving for the States. And he said, um, so when are you applying for your MBA? So he thought, okay, this guy had this kida in his head, came, <laughs> did Ab ho it. Now he'll head back. <laughs> so I told him, I said, I'm thinking I'll give myself until December. Let me see what happens till December. And I don't know if I had a plan. Maybe I would have had the courage to go past December. I, I don't know for sure. I gave myself until December and Mami happened in November. That thing that you were saying about what happened in Mami is what dreams are made of. Because you, you could not have expected... It was the first festival in Mumbai, right? I mean, we added an extra screening I because remember. the first three popular were sold demand. Out by popular demand yes. and they had these printed things yes. there. Yeah. I mean, it was just unreal, you know, standing at the back of the hall and watching the audiences laugh. Um, I don't think I'll ever be able to duplicate. No, nothing will even ever come close to that. Really? Yeah, because uh, it's a pipe dream, right? Initially for years, I lay in my bed in Atlanta and I had one sign on the wall in front of me, uh, which I borrowed from Nike, uh, printed in large letters, just do it, you know, just telling myself, you know, just do it, just do it. And then finally you come full circle and you're standing there uh, at the back of the NCPA theater. Uh, it was a fire hazard. There were people in the, and this was the fourth, the added screening. And there were people in the aisles. There were people in the aisles, they were sitting on the stairwells, they were sitting everywhere, the door, you know, they, these guys were yelling and they were trying to slam it shut. The people standing out. <laughs> doesn't make sense. Doesn't make sense. Uh, happily, doesn't make sense. But that's how amazing is that? Yeah. And it happened twice, Anupam. It happened twice. It happens there. I get a distributor. The movie goes on to do what it does. And finally, Shamshroff, Shringar Films, 
uh, and I asked him really, I said, why would you be interested in a film like this? By which time I'd been spending a little bit of time in India. And he said, I'm hoping that it'll be the next Full Monty. Those were his exact words. Because Full Monty had gone on to do like 100 million yeah. US yeah. at that time. So Hyderabad Blues releases in Sinestar Goregaon, July 17, 1998, one show, one 9.30 p.m. show. One show? One show. Wait, the film released with one show, one, one theatre? One show, one theatre in freaking Goregaon. <laughs> it was a theatre that Tringar Films controlled. So Shamshov told me, he said, I have quote unquote blocked this. If this thing goes for two weeks, I'll consider it a hit. That's what he said. If it just plays, for the way he was looking at it, if mm. create enough buzz, play it for two weeks, and then sell it to Star or something like that. Right. Yeah. So July 17th rolls around. He's papered half the house. So what he's done is he's taken tickets tied up with Shopper Stop. And for like every 200 bucks you spent, you sure. got a free ticket of Hyderabad right. Blues. So or it's something. a bonus. Absolutely. Invites friends and family. Mind you, pre-internet days. July 17th, we're all standing there. And we sold out the theater. Really? Now explain that to me. Where did these people come from? And everyone will attest to that night. It was raining cats and dogs, like Bombay does in mid-July. Yeah, yeah. So that's why he was able to get the slot. All this I realized in hindsight. July, none of the big, you know, correct, movies. Correct. Back in the day, yeah, you yeah, know, all yeah. these were yeah, factors sure. that people took into consideration, right? Yeah. And July 17th, the very first show we, uh, show we sold out. And Bala Shroff, Sham Shroff's older brother, comes down and he says, Sir, house full ho I mean, I remember him saying that, uh, like, uh, and of course, two weeks became five, and then uh, Eros called and asked for it. And I remember Shamshav telling me Eros is taking it, and then of course, it <laughs> just blew up happily. <laughs> and yet, you've never seen your film? Not since the day I made it, no. You never revisit? I have a problem with uh, every film I make. Uh, I, I just... Um, and this is not getting dramatic, but I know other filmmakers also have this problem. So I'm, I'm not in some isolated company here. Um, I'm too harsh on myself. I can only see the mistakes. So I, I can't forgive myself and just enjoy stuff that I've done. Because every film is a function of time, right? It, it happened back then when you had a certain set of values and beliefs and you make something. And I just cannot you know, separate myself from that and say, you know, I was a different guy back then. Just enjoy it for what it's worth. So no, I've never gone back and seen. And there's a, initially people thought, oh, this guy's just quirky, he'll get over it. But there is an unspoken rule at home with family or anything. When I'm around, my movies will not play on TV or any nonsense like that. Really? Yeah. Or if you insist on watching it, be my guest, I'm not going to be in the same room. Mm -hmm. So. Nagesh, what's the most important lesson you learned from Hyderabad Blues that you still kind of follow? Yeah, just do your own thing. Um, if you can get something like Hyderabad Blues to succeed against all odds, and trust me, I've tried listing them, and it just, like I've already said it half a dozen times it's in this interview, it doesn't make sense right. how something like that could have worked, yeah. right? Seen the light of day. If that happens, then I will never second guess myself on what is right or what is wrong. I'm just going to do my own thing. And this mantra has, trust me, burnt me more often than helped me, as <laughs> my 20-year <laughs> career will attest. But it's something that I live by. For the simple reason, that if I ever start questioning what I think others will like or what others might say about my material, Hyderabad Blues would have been a total wasted, uh, uh, you know, turning point, possibly the most important point in my life. It not only, you know, changed the direction of uh, uh, my career, it uh, made me a different person. So I think to question that would sort of s shake the foundation of where I stand. Uh, th that's a mantra I live by. I 
and I've made more enemies than friends. I, I don't listen to people. I, I do my own thing. I don't show my film to anyone. I don't hold trials. Uh, Lakshmi was the only one that uh, I did differently. Oh. And Iqbal, I can't. We held 50 trials, and I can't say anything for that because that was Subhash Gai doing the trials. For me, uh, 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 the filmmaking process has been such a, a wonderfully selfish, enjoyable personal journey that uh, the day I finish a film is the day the journey ends. And it's time to begin a new one, which is why I don't go back and watch my films. Now let's try. So this is this is something I This I've is the one. Yeah, this is the one I, I live by. I'm like that had no business succeeding and if it, it did because I foolishly followed some something that I had in my head, I'm gonna do it with everything I do. Nice. Wow. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thank you, Nagesh, and congratulations on twenty years of Hedgebar oh, Blues. Never thought I'd still be here. <laughs> <laughs> That's the most amazing thing. And still making movies. I'm still making movies. I mean, uh, how many people can actually say that? M good, bad, successful, sure. not successful. But, you know, just the fact that you're kicking and you're making movies. I mean, something that... How wonderful is that? Incredible. <laughs> Blessed and incredible. <laughs> Thank you. My pleasure. Hi, this is Nagesh Kuknur. And if you like this video, please subscribe to Film Companion.